libertarianism is pro-immigration, pro-market, pro-trade. More competitive, less centralized. Not military confrontations, but peaceful interaction. The war on drugs has been actually an unmitigated disaster. Is production and quite possibly loss-inducing prices uh, because people at a lower price will buy more. They'll stockpile, which also puts off the day when the big guy can uh, actually cash in on it because they'll have stockpiles of dirt cheap stuff that might uh, uh, last them for a while. There's no certainty as to how quickly uh, all these other competitors, even if they're tiny, will um, uh, go out of business. And there's no certainty that they won't reappear if the price does go back up. You know, uh, in 1890, when Rockefeller had 90% of the kerosene market, there were, it's true that none of the other competitors were very big. All told, 66 other competitors only comprised 10% of the market. So they're all very, very tiny. Some of them, however, are only tiny for a moment. They are the big guys of a few years later, like a pure oil company, the Sun Oil Company, and so forth. Um, let's suppose in 1890 he had driven the price down so low uh, that uh, all 66 other competitors left the market. And let's ignore the actual price history and say after he drove them all out, which he didn't, uh, then he raised the price back, probably not just to where it was before, right? Now what's the idea there? You, you want to do this so you can raise it even higher. But if 66 other competitors felt it worth their while to compete with you when the price was here, how many are going to feel worth their while to get into the business and the prices up here? So the more the predator tries to cash in on this, the more it's like hanging out a sign. Competitors want it. He just gives other, uh, uh, maybe even the guys who were in business just went out <coughs> of business for a brief time or sold their business for a song to another guy who comes in with low capital costs and can, can compete uh, head to head especially if the big guy raises his price too much. Um, for a, that's just a sample of reasons I know I need to move along because we've got three other quick charges here. But uh, you can read an essay uh, I've written on this very thing on, on our website. It's called, uh, the same title as this talk, Witch Hunting for Robber Barons, in which I go into each of these charges in more detail. Let's run through the others real quick. Another charge is that uh, he bought out competitors. That's how he got big. Every time somebody appeared as a competitor, he bought them out, gobbled them up, so that now they couldn't compete with him. It's true that he bought a lot of other companies. That's a, that's a very important way in which the uh, Standard Oil Company got bigger, because there were a lot of people who were in the oil business early, like you find in any business, just because they wanted to make a quick buck. Throw up a refinery, make a few quick bucks, don't worry about having to be a good manager of it because you can sell it to Rockefeller or somebody else a few years later, okay? The marginal ones, the less efficient ones, they were on the market in no time, and he would say, oh great, a refinery already built. I'll, I'll buy it. He had no power to compel anybody to sell a refinery. He may have gotten the best deal he could. What's wrong with that? Don't you do that as, as, as consumers? We all do that. Uh, and there's plenty of evidence that he drove a hard bargain when he bought a refiner. He didn't just walk in and say, just made your price. That's not how, how anybody ever really gets big. He, um, there's also evidence, there was a guy named Daniel P. Reinhardt who got the, he worked for Rockefeller for a time. He kind of got the message that, hmm, Rockefeller likes to buy refineries. Well, maybe I'll leave the Standard Oil Company and I'll just build refineries. And I'll just say, hey, John D., you either buy my refinery or I'll open it up and compete with you. So he sold three successive refineries uh, to Rockefeller. Now, maybe Rockefeller thought he was buying them because uh, he wanted to keep them from operating, but he didn't buy them and then shut them down. He bought them at a song or the best price he could. Reichardt made out uh, by selling re the refineries. He didn't have to worry about how to make them run. Just build them. So this idea of buying up competitors, let's say he tried that in 1890, and he thought, oh, that's the way to get big or even bigger, up by all the other 66 competitors. How many more do you think would be knocking on his door if he had done that? Would that have been the end of it? Oh, everybody else said, hey, he's in the refinery buying business. Let's build a refinery. I mean, this idea you can become big by just throwing money at refineries and doing nothing with them, uh, just 
to, to try to keep out the competition, that's ridiculous. Only a progressive or a socialist would think that's, that's the way business works. <laughs> Another uh, charge against uh, Rockefeller is this idea of uh, collusion and conspiracy. Okay, they think, oh, well, the same guy gets it all from all different directions, you know. Oh, he preyed upon his competitors through predatory price cutting. Oh, no, he bought them out. And now here's the third charge. Oh, well, he colluded with them, conspired with them to raise prices. Okay. Now, there is some evidence that, uh, that uh, Rockefeller, like many businessmen, uh, were often frustrated by the winds of unexpected competition. What businessman wouldn't like to operate in, the, in a market devoid of competition? I mean, they'd all love that. Right? Most, most would. Most of us would. Competition is, it makes us better, but it also is a hard thing you have to worry about. It can run you into the ground if you're not as good as the other guy. Well, um, this theory suggests that Rockefeller maybe got together with the others in the business, in the industry, and conspired with them to uh, raise prices. Okay? No evidence of this, by the way but it's often thrown out as a charge. Let's see how easy this process might be. Let's say I'm Rockefeller. I'm the guy with 90%. I'm at the peak of my market share. And you are, you are from all the other smaller competitors. And I've called a secret meeting, okay, where we're gonna uh, uh, get prices in the market up. We're all complaining how low prices are. Uh, we'd like to see higher prices. Now, what's the first problem now? we have to solve if we're going to somehow get a higher price. It's a production problem. What am I thinking? What do we have to do with total production if we expect in the marketplace to get a higher price? We have to cut production, right? If we're all pumping out as much kerosene uh, as before, we're already at a market price. We, how do you get it higher? Not by pumping out the same amount of stuff. We have to agree on somehow reducing production. Now, is there any evidence that markets saw a reduction in the supply of kerosene? No, refineries were going up all over the world. There's no evidence of, of this. As long as there was demand for it, the stuff was being cranked out. But imagine if we decide, as competitors, we got to restrict production so we can get a higher price. You think that's going to be easy uh, to arrive at? Maybe I'll say, oh, well, I realize I'm the big guy, but let's just all cut our production by an even 10% a piece. That would be fair to everybody. We'll all cut production by 10%, then we can get a higher price for what we sell. Are you all going to say, oh, sure, yeah, we'll do that? No, for a number of reasons. You're going to say, that's not fair, John D. You're a big guy. you got all these advantages. I'm new, blah, blah, blah. So a 10% cut for you really is like, uh, should be just 5% for me. You're going to think of all kinds of reasons why, if the price is going up, you ought to increase your production, not cut it, right? In fact, I would tell you this, that if, we had, if I could get you all to agree to cut your production and raise your price, I might well do it. And then as soon as I leave the room, I get on the telephone to your, your customers. And I'd say, hey, you know, I know you weren't buying from me or buying from this other guy. But uh, I'm going to tell you now, prices are going up. But if you buy from me, switch your purchases to my company, I'll, I'll give it to you for less than you can get it in the market. In other words, the very thing that brought us together, the desire for more profit, is what breaks the agreement apart. How do you make more money once you have a price-fixing, re production-reducing agreement? You break it, right? And you hope the other guys keep it. This is exactly what OPEC tried to do. Exactly. Even governments, you know, who have the bottomless pit of the taxpayer to draw upon to subsidize their misbehavior, even they, it doesn't work for them. You know, they think for a time, oh, we'll cut production and raise prices. They're always struggling with the cheater. Somebody else who says, well, good, you keep your prices high, I'll, I'll undercut it. That's how I make money. So this usually ends up a lot, a complete headache for the people who thought. Uh, uh, that this was easy. We just arrived at agreement, but hey, all you got to do is break it. And that's how you make money. So this collusion and conspiracy stuff, not only is there no evidence of it, 
in, in, in actual prices, quantities produced, and so forth, um, it doesn't, it's a lot easier said than done. And I'll give you one, maybe, yeah, one other uh, last charge, uh, real quick, and that is that, uh, well, okay, maybe Rockefeller was a good businessman, but he was greedy. Why did he make all this money? You know, how, why was he in the business? Was it because he liked us? Was it because he wanted to do us favors oh, or be compassionate? No, it was because he wanted to make money. And that we need to control that, or that's bad news. Okay? He was greedy. How do we respond to that? Do we say, oh, yeah, he really should have been in the business just for, for the sake of helping other people? Uh, you ever think about how much gets done in the world for that altruistic, charitable motive? versus how much gets done because of the desire to improve your well-being through earning a profit. Look at everything around you. I think the people that made the lights said, oh, well, I'm glad to make a loss on that because I want to help the kids. Do you think the farmers who grew the food that you ate today did it at a loss so just out of a, as a favor to you? No, do you do that? No, we all try to improve our well-being. And we do it through serving others and the better we do that, the more likely we're going to make some nice profits from it. But the moment we part from the winning formula that gave us that high market share, uh, the, we're in trouble because somebody else can come along uh, and undercut us. Now, you can prevent that from happening though, in a lot of ways. Government can come in and say, well, we're going to make sure nobody competes with this guy, or we're going to favor him, or we're just going to have an economy that's so bound up with taxes and regulation that newcomers just don't even bother to start a business. You ever think of that? You can, you can actually make an economy rigid and thereby benefit the existing big guys at the expense of the prospective newcomers just by binding it up with enough regulations, politics, taxes, that uh, a, a new guy says, huh, what? I can't, I can't start from scratch like my granddaddy did out of the garage. Got to be big guy right from the get-go because to deal with all this garbage. And there are endless numbers of people in the country today who I think are thinking that, saying that, and behaving that way because of the, the barriers that we put in front of them. How many other John D. Rock Rockefellers are we preventing from ever materializing because we've made our economy rigid with uh, controls and all the hoops you have to jump through, the bureaucracy, uh, just to get a start? That's a sad thing because that it's newcomers in business that provide uh, so many uh, new jobs that stimulate innovations and, and new directions, new products uh, and inventions across the board. Well, so that's my standard oral lecture. I hope I've at least planted enough seeds to make you think maybe John D. Rockefeller wasn't the villain he's often made out to be. If you'd like to read more about it, um, and you certainly can on our website. If you type in John D. Rockefeller, you'll find. Uh, 